Hey, I want to welcome everybody here this morning as we have lots of visitors and that's fun to see. It's the last Christmas, be- or the last Sunday rather, before Christmas, uh, which is uh, why we're wrapping up our four-week Christmas series today. And it's one that we've called All I Want for Christmas. And I'm pretty sure, Spence did a lot of the work on this one, and I'm pretty sure it's because of that song, All I Want for Christmas is my, is my two front teeth. Yes, so um, we kind of teased him about that, but uh, I'm just thankful that he didn't pick Grandma Got Ran Over by a Reindeer or something like that. Now, this series that we're in is from Isaiah 9-6. It is based on that, which reads, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And today we're going to look at that fourth and final title that Isaiah has given our Savior in this verse, Prince of Peace. Now over the last few weeks, our growing Christmas list has consisted of someone to advise me, wonderful counselor, someone to rescue me, mighty God, and last week, someone to provide, protect, guide, and love me, as in our everlasting Father, our giver of eternal life. And this week, we add this final request for Christmas, someone to give me true peace, as in the Prince of Peace. Now, I think we would all agree this morning that peace is something we all want. There could be a few exceptions. You know, some people do make money off of wars or things like that, but they're rare. Most of us truly want peace. But if we're to state our desire for a Prince of Peace this Christmas, I think it brings with it some obvious questions. Do we really know what peace is? How does the world view peace? How does the Bible view peace? How do we achieve achieve true peace? And how does Jesus make peace possible as our Prince of Peace? And we're going to attempt to answer some of those questions this morning, but before we do, let's pray. Father, we come before you now and we open your word. Your word is truth, and it is what we want to impact our hearts today. Lord, help us. Help us today to understand the message you would have for us from your word. And may we not just hear it, Lord. May we truly receive it into our hearts and let it do its work in us. That's what you intended it to do. So Lord, we pray for that this morning as we study, as we pray, as we meditate, as we lean on your word for understanding. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's begin by looking at how the the world or the people outside the church view peace, or as we'll say, the world's view of peace. Now, when I say that, and I say the world, I want to make sure we all understand what I'm talking about as far as outside the church. There are people out there with different worldviews. They don't believe in the Bible. Or they believe that maybe the Bible is just a collection of some good stories, but that it's not God's word, it's not true, it's not without error. There may be some fun stories in there for bedtime that they like to share with folks, but they do not see it as God's word. As a matter of fact, there are many people out there that don't even believe there is a God. There are others that believe uh, we have many gods out there. And anything can pretty much become a god. I can go chop down a tree. I can make a cord of firewood out of half of it and then make a beautiful sculpture out of the other half and worship that. That becomes my god. There are others that think that God created the world and then backed off. And he has no relationship with us. He doesn't care. He is a distant god. That's what I'm talking about when I say the world's view of peace, a world without God and without his truth. Now, I want you to notice 
as I get into this definition here of peace, how these definitions involve our circumstances. So let's look at them. From the, uh, from the uh, dictionary, rather, there's four of them. Number one, in a general sense, a state of quiet or tranquility, freedom from disturbance or agitation. Also, we have freedom from war with a foreign nation. Freedom from national commotion, like civil war or civil unrest. And then last, freedom from private quarrels, suits, or disturbances. I think it's safe to say that 2020 was not a peaceful year from the world's point of view. Now, I tried very hard this week to remember a Christmas in my life where none of these conditions were taking place. And I failed. I failed. Uh, now, I could think far enough back to a time when we weren't at war with another nation, and certainly we haven't had a civil war for over 150 years, but never, ever, as far back as my feeble memory would take me, could I recall a Christmas where there was a state of quiet tranquility along with no disturbances, no civil unrest, and certainly no private quarrels. As a matter of fact, it reminded me that Christmas, right, a time when we love to sing Christmas songs about joy, goodwill towards men, and peace on earth, seems to bring out the worst in some people. We hear about it. Some of you have possibly even witnessed some of these things. The very opposite of peace, as the world describes it. Just earlier this week, I want to give you some examples here. I, I read a headline or some headlines from a, a major news source, and it said this. Undercover cops dressed as Santa and his elf fight crime at a California shopping center. I thought, how would you like to be the parent trying to explain why Santa and his elf are taking somebody off in cuffs? <laughs> Doesn't seem very peaceful to me. Or holiday shopping season kicks off with fights, arrests. Seems to me like the night before Christmas has become the fight before Christmas in our world. And usually because there's a lack of something that people want. Actually, they would tell you something they need. They got to have this. I, I want you to just know there is, this has been going on for several years. How many of you here remember Cabbage Patch dolls? Quite a few, actually. Um, how many of you remember the Cabbage Patch Kids Christmas Riots of 1983? Remember that? It would go down in history as one of the world's most intense Black Friday sales. People physically fought each other, parents usually, to get one for their kid. Other parents traveled around the world to different countries just to try to get their hands on one. And it's not the only time that Christmas violence has erupted over a lack of elusive toys in stores. Do you remember Tickle Me Elmo? <laughs> or Teddy Ruxpin? Or how about the Furby fiasco? The battles for Beanie Babies? And if you're an electronic uh, game player, there's a uh, Nintendo Wii, the PlayStation, Xbox 360, and if you want to go back to the very beginning of it, Atari. Yes, very good. Somebody remembers Atari over here. And more recently, it's been like Star Wars figures, that kind of stuff. I, I think the hot thing now is the child from The Mandalorian. Is, is that a big deal? Okay, the kids are saying yes, it is. But perhaps the most famous was the official Red Rider BB gun. <laughs> yeah, now we're going back, aren't we? Now, I don't know about you, 
but fighting over Christmas toys doesn't sound very peaceful to me. You know, I often wonder, are any of those things still as, as popular as they were at the time? Oh, red, the Red Rider. Okay, the Red Rider is. The rest are probably just a product of great marketing, right? Now, we can even get away from the retail scene, and let me ask you this. How many of you remember John Lennon's 1969 hit song, Give Peace a Chance? Okay? You know that some secular radio stations actually treat that as a Christmas song. Maybe because peace is in the title. I'm not sure, but... Now, apparently, John Lennon thought, if everyone would just quit fighting and give peace a chance, then everything would be all right. Peace would reign. But he was focusing on our circumstances, our external surroundings, and primarily a lack of hostility. Well, I got to tell you, I don't think the world's definition for peace has been realized yet. So, if peace is really so sought after around the world today, why hasn't the world found it yet? Well, I think it's because people are concentrating on the absence of conflict in, in their lives, in their, their cities, their countries, or even in the world in order to proclaim that true peace has finally arrived. As believers, we know that ever since the fatal bites were taken from the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, the peace on this earth has been disturbed. Sin entered in and it continues to contaminate the world. So then, is peace still possible? Well, let's look at the biblical view of peace or how the Bible describes peace because I think you're going to see a noticeable difference here. And so this is the definition I found Peace, a word often translated peace in the Bible, and I'm going to tell you that word in just a second, it actually means to tie together as a whole. When all essential parts are joined together, inner peace then is a wholeness of mind and spirit, a whole heart at rest. And I love this last part, inner peace has little to do with external surroundings. So the word that's most often translated is from the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, and it's one we still hear today. Any ideas? Shalom, yes. And the word shalom is still used as a common greeting, and it can mean hello or goodbye in Israel or to the Jews. And it's a greeting that carries with it a wish of peace to that person, whether they're coming or going. And the root word of shalom is one that emphasizes this idea of wholeness or completeness. Now, there is also a New Testament word for peace, and the meaning is very, very similar. And I'm so grateful because um, I have no idea how to pronounce it in Greek. Okay, Spence tried with me this week. I do remember, Spence, that it, it's the word we get the name Irene from. Correct? Yeah, okay, thank you. Now, so, so we've seen how the world tries to define peace as being a lack of bad circumstances happening to us, which involves this mindset of no struggles, no hardships, no fears, no worries, no aches, no pains, no wars, no fighting. In other words, if I don't have these external difficulties in my life, then peace is possible. But the Bible definition of peace doesn't focus on the lack of outside difficulties in a person's life. It focuses on that wholeness or that completeness of that person's life. And this comes with a couple of significant implications when applied to our inner peace, our wholeness. First, notice that the concept of shalom peace implies that for us to experience peace, to be whole, 
bad things must happen. That is not the way the world views peace. Not from the world's view. And it might sound strange to you also, so let me try and explain. You see, all of the hardships and struggles that we face in life act as an alarm that tells us that something within us is not right. We are not whole the way God intended us to be. God originally created a perfect world, and he created Adam and Eve to live in it and have dominion over that world. But when they sinned, all the bad things we have to live with today were introduced. Thanks to Adam, we are infected with sin. Our new norm is pain, insecurity, toil, and hardship. So thank you, Adam. Now, hopefully, nobody here today thinks this is something new, right? We know it happened from the beginning. Genesis 3, it's in there. You can read it. Some 3,000 years ago, King David pleaded with God when he prayed in Psalm 38. And it is a strong reminder to us of sin's power to break our lives apart, to make us incomplete. Now, we're going to read Psalm 38, but I just want to warn you ahead, ahead of time. It is not a feel-good psalm. Let's look at the first 11 verses. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down on me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. Whew. You fired up yet? Verse 9, all my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pounds. My strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. We thought we invented social distancing. There it is in the Bible. And Psalm 38 reminds us that sin is quite effective when it comes to breaking our lives apart and destroying our peace. But without the struggles that it brings, we would not be aware of the wholeness or that completeness that God has intended for us. So those need to serve as alarms, those struggles, those hardships. And that leads us right into our second implication here. The lack of shalom peace means that something is missing. Something's missing. So if we're not whole, if we're incomplete, what's missing? Well, after listening to David's prayer, you know, you could probably think of a whole list of things that are missing. But Isaiah sums it up in chapter 59, verse 2, when he says, Your iniquities, meaning your sin, have separated you from your God. We're separated from God. And that leaves a void in our lives. A void left to be filled that only can be found in God. He is our peace. He is the one that completes us. He is the one that makes us whole. So even with all our struggles and hardships, peace is only possible with God. And God has made that possible by giving us the gift of peace, his son, our prince of peace. It's his promise to those that believe in him. Before his betrayal and crucifixion, Jesus shares this promise with his disciples in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. He's speaking of the salvation that his death, burial, and resurrection will achieve for those that believe in him. That wholeness, completeness, and true peace through renewed fellowship with God. He's a holy God. We are sinful people. Only Jesus Christ can renew that fellowship. And it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. The world can only long for that kind of peace. So, how does the Prince of Peace complete us? How does he make us whole? I want to share something with you, a little something that Marianne shared with me, my wife Marianne, Monday morning before uh, I, I got started here. And it's from John Piper. Many of you are probably familiar with John Piper. And I believe it ties in all four titles that Isaiah gives Jesus in chapter 9, verse 6 of his book. He bases this, John Piper does, on a New Testament or two New Testament verses, actually three we're going to see, from 1 John 3. So verse 7, it starts out, Dear children, okay, as an everlasting father, he would address us as dear children. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. I'm going to slightly paraphrase some of John Piper's words, but he has this to say about these verses. Ponder this remarkable situation with me. If the Son of God came first to help you stop sinning, to destroy the works of the devil, and if second, he came to die so that when you do sin, there is propitiation, which is, is undeserved payment for our sin, a removal of God's wrath, then what does this double truth imply for living your life? How does the Prince of Peace help tie together your life, make it whole and complete and offer you a life of true peace? Three things he says, and they are wonderful to have. I give them to you briefly as Christmas presents. So John Piper is giving you this morning three Christmas presents. As our everlasting father, his children, he gives us a clear purpose for living. In its simplest form, Jesus is saying in 1 John 3, don't sin. Don't be led astray. But John will say this in a positive way here a few verses later in the same chapter. In verse 23, he says, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Now, while this sounds like two different commands to us, they are so closely connected that John calls them one command. Believe Jesus, love others. This is your implied purpose for living in this truth. Trust Jesus, love people. And every good father gives his children a purpose for living. There is no peace in our lives without a clear purpose purpose. The second implication of the twofold truth that Christ came to destroy our sinning and to forgive our sins is this. We make progress in overcoming our sins when we have hope that our failures will be forgiven. Without that hope, you're likely to give up when you're fighting your sin. And there's no peace in that. Many of you may be pondering some changes for this coming New Year's because maybe you've fallen into some sinful patterns and want out of them. Maybe some new patterns of eating or entertainment or new patterns of giving. Uh, maybe you're looking for better ways to relate to your spouse or to have family devotions or new patterns of sleep or exercise or maybe even renewed courage to witness to unbelievers. So 
Here's your second Christmas present from John Piper. Christ not only came to destroy the works of the devil, our sinning, but as mighty God, he also came to be an advocate for us when we fail in our fight to get us back on the road to peace. And Piper goes on to say, So I plead with you, let the freedom to fail give you the hope to fight. But beware. If you turn the grace of God into license and say, well, if I can fail and it doesn't matter, why bother fighting? If you say that and you mean it and you act on it, you are probably not born again. And that should give you cause to tremble because you're never going to know true peace if you're not saved. But that's probably not where most of you are this morning. Most of you want to fight the sinful patterns in your life. And what God is saying to you is this. Let the freedom to fail give you hope to fight. I write this to you that you might not sin. But if you do, you have an advocate, Jesus Christ, mighty God. And that gives us real hope that the world doesn't have. And our final Christmas present from John Piper that comes from uh, this double truth that Christ came to destroy our sinning and to forgive our sins is this. As our wonderful counselor, Christ will really help us in our fight. He really will help you. He's on your side. He didn't come to destroy sin because sin is fun. He came to destroy sin because it's fatal. And I'm reminded of the verses from James 1, from Jesus' brother, verses 14 and 15. It says this, Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. It's a fatal progression. And I heard this illustration probably 20 years ago on a study of James. And it says this, sin is like a fishing lure. You pick the one that's most enticing to the fish so they'll be tempted to bite it. Right? The fish sees it and it wants it. And once he does, he's hooked and in the fight of his life. And he either manages to escape or he ends up in the frying pan. Sin is a deceptive work of the devil and will destroy us if we don't fight it. So as our wonderful counselor, we have to remember Jesus is not against us. He is for us. He will help you. You can trust him. So I want to wrap this up today by um, saying this. I believe that Jesus' role as the Prince of Peace really encapsulates the other three. We experience wholeness that comes from someone who gives perfect advice, wonderful counselor. We have an advocate who rescues us from the worst dangers, an everlasting father who provides, guides, protects, and loves us. And only, only our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace can complete us and give us true peace. So I thought, you know, I thought, well, man, today in the message, there's a lot of implications. There's this, we're jumping here, double truths. So I thought, man, I pray this isn't a confusing message today about peace. And then uh, I'm telling you, the Lord gave me (laughs) something yesterday Uh, Or Friday, it was Friday that he gave it to me. And it comes from one of my wife's t-shirts or sweatshirts. And she even has a key ring that says this. So if I can, if you remember nothing else today, I want to sum up today's message with eight words. Some of you are probably saying, why don't you just give us the eight words and close in prayer? Well, because I don't think it would make sense if you didn't have the background. So here's the first four words. No Jesus, no peace. 
The next four, no Jesus, no peace, and spelling counts. So let's close in prayer, folks. Father, Father, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to make a way for us to renew our relationship with you, to help us achieve completeness, to be whole as you intended us to be. We live in a world that struggles and longs to find peace, but doesn't know where to look to find it. Lord, help us to be your witnesses to them, to introduce them to truth, the truth of the gospel. Because we know as believers that your peace is a peace that they'll never understand without Jesus providing the way. Thank you for the gift of peace this Christmas. May each of us here come to fully understand that we have an everlasting Father that gives us a clear purpose for living, a mighty God that can rescue us, be our advocate, which gives us a hope that the world doesn't have, and a wonderful counselor who is for us. Thank you, Father, for showing us the real meaning of peace in your word and through your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.